Tak, tak chvíli máte, dobrý den. I'd like to talk to you today about simulating vision. And I don't mean simulating vision in general, but simulating the vision of a particular patient, simulating the vision of you, if we can simulate and measure your own uh, uh, visual components in your eye. So I think everybody is familiar with some kind of eye chart, perhaps not this one, uh, and you have gone to the eye doctor and had your eyes tested. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about why I feel that maybe we should look at some newer technology. Uh, this is from the 18th century. <laughs> and uh, so the first thing I'd like to say is, let's say you are having your eyes tested and you get to that point down, down, down on the chart. For some of you, it's not so far down. And you are not too sure of what a letter is. So I don't know if I can do this, but I will try. Uh, yes, let's say, for example, here, now, I don't know how many of you can see it. I, I will, maybe some of you are struggling and you think it is a D or a B, but you're not too sure which. And so the eye doctor says to you, you should just take a guess. That is actually the, the medical protocol. And you say D and they say, right. How do you feel? <laughs> you feel good, right? But I would like to say I don't want to take away your good feeling, but from my perspective, I feel bad because really it's not a test about how well you're going to do. It's a, it's a method of conveying to your doctor who's going to help you what your vision is. And in some sense, you accidentally misled the doctor by making him or her think you saw that well because there's no distinguishing between you and another patient who said D and got it right and saw it very clearly. So that's one concern or one criticism I have with this. And then there's the flip side, the other way around. Let us say you do not see it correctly and you report incorrectly. You say B. The only information we have is right or wrong. I'm a computer scientist. We would say one bit of information. You got it wrong. But we don't really know what you saw or how you saw it wrong. And what's interesting is we should think about the many ways we can see something incorrectly visually. You may see a smooth blur. You may see a double image you may see certain distortions. And that's part of what we would like to do in this project. So some of the motivations and applications of the work are to work with medical students to try to help them understand these different kinds of visual anomalies or problems, simulate these visual disorders for a particular patient to show it to the doctor, and also associated with surgical procedures, such as LASIK, if you're familiar with this, where the cornea has its shape changed to uh, modify vision. And we would like to show patients what, how they may see afterwards if the surgery goes well. And if the surgery doesn't go well, we think they should be shown that as well. And certain kinds of side effects or secondary effects that often occur, so they can be better informed to make a decision about surgery like this. So quickly, just want to review uh, some ocular uh, anatomy. The, uh, inside the eye, there are three elements that we will talk about today. The cornea is the very front part of the eye. Then there's the crystalline lens here and the retina in the back. Now, I'd like to ask you, how, how many of you think, between the cornea and the crystalline lens, which one of those does most of the bending of light? Okay. So how many vote for the cornea as doing most of the bending of light? Now, I can't see too well. Okay. And how many vote for the lens as doing most of the bending of light? Okay. The lens won profoundly here, um, which is why maybe we should not do science by democracy. <laughs> so if you learn nothing else today, you will learn that, in fact, the lens just has a better marketing department. It's got a better name, but actually it's the cornea that's doing about twice as much of the bending of light as the, as, the, uh, as the lens. And that's important to understand. Now, one of the things that we might look at with that is could we take the information from the cornea and use that to simulate how that patient is seeing? And indeed, we have an instrument that you see here. It's got a very fancy name in English, and I have worked with the interpreters to try to translate it into Czech. Corneal topography. It means measuring the shape of the cornea. And uh, the instrument is shown here. I uh, have to confess that the image that you see uh, on your right with, with me there is a little bit embarrassing. Uh, I was, uh, had the New York Times come and write about my research. They thought, uh, photographed 200 photographs of me and they chose to run this one, which I think is because they wanted something, something looking like a crazy professor. 
So there it is in the New York Times. But this measures the cornea, and this was our first attempt at, at simulating vision by taking the information from the shape of the cornea. But we found that, like in anything else in research, after you do something and you're very happy with that, the very next day, what you do is you go back and try to criticize your own work, look at the limitations and see if you can improve it. And there were ways to improve it, and the ways to improve it were to go to a new instrument that was just becoming available at that time with another fancy name called the Wavefront Aberometer. And uh, this is my colleague, Stan Klein. Uh, he's a physicist, but we dressed him up in a white coat so he would look like a doctor. I'm playing the patient, and what we have here is measuring the shape, not the shape of the cornea now, but the actual optical wavefront uh, inside, the, inside the eye. Now, we then use some mathematics that is, I just think, beautiful, and we say in our terminology, elegant mathematics, and I'm allowed to say such nice things because I had nothing to do with developing this mathematics. It was actually developed by Fritz Zernike, who was a, dit, a Dutch uh, scientist and a Nobel laureate, uh, and uh, he developed these, this mathematics that are known as Zernike polynomials. Now, I'm just going to show you this slide quickly. I hope that people are not running for the doors. The instant I show you something as complex as this, I could spend two hours discussing this. Don't worry, I will spend only 10 seconds. Uh, but what I want to tell you, the key point, is what's so beautiful about this is that these are mathematical functions, and each one represents a different kind of visual or optical aberration in your eye, a different type of visual problem. And we, in this, in using this instrument, can determine how much of each of these each person has. And the, another key thing is this little green line that I've drawn here is my favorite green line because the aberrations above the line are low order, and that means that they're correctable by your eyeglasses, and those below the green line are high order and are not. And this is something no one ever seems to talk about. It's profoundly important. So those of you sitting here with your eyeglasses seeing well should be happy you have your aberrations above the line. And for some of you who have the aberrations below the line, there's very little that can be done about that. And some of our current research, which I'm not getting to talk about today, is actually trying to address that, that question. So our, our overview of our method very briefly is that we take an image, it may be computer generated, it may be a photograph, but it's going to be used to show what the patient sees. And we break it up into, uh, into depth images depending on depth, and we blur different depths depending on how far away they are according to the information that we've measured. That's a very quick overview of something complex. Here's the image that we might start with. You can see everything is in focus, and then after our, ap our uh, application of our approach, or our algorithm, we might have the baby be out of focus and the toy stay in focus. This is actually a little animation that we make because we do some work with animation as well, but it's this basic principle that we can then extend to the human vision problem that we're talking about. About. So here's an original image that everything is perfect, computer generated, perfectly sharp focus, and I will show you how we simulate it given real data that we have measured from various patients. And the first one is somebody who is moderately myopic. That means nearsighted in a way that's not too serious, and I'm sure many of you in this audience see without your eyeglasses or contact lenses in a way like this, a very smooth blur. Now let's look at somebody who has high myopia. Same type of problem, but much greater amount of myopia. Some of you may have that. Uh, and the, and the, for people like this, you wake up in the middle of the night and you cannot even focus on the clock radio on the table because of your, your uh, severe myopia. So it's a very, very blurred image, but it's a very smooth blur. And that's part of what I want to talk about today, too, are these different kinds of blurs. Now here's something called astigmatism, and I think it's a similar word in Czech. And again, very common, and the good news is it's above my green line. That means that you can be corrected with your eyeglasses, and many of you are. You may or may not be aware of it. Uh, and it's interesting because astigmatism actually gives you different blur in different directions. And if you can look very closely, you may notice that this edge is actually relatively sharp, where this edge is, is more blurred. And that's because this particular patient 
has a lot of astigmatism and it's aligned horizontally and vertically. That's why we use this data and we're very pleased to see that our simulation produced the result that we would want given that understanding that we have of, of astigmatism. Now let me show you something that probably one person in this room, if that, has ever heard of. It's an eye pathology called keratoconus, and this is a, a, a cornea whose shape has an irregular shape to it. The cornea has an irregular shape, and this produces visual artifacts that are complex, and, and you get distortions like you see here. And so one of the things to point out to you is these are higher order aberrations. This means that these, uh, this vision that we have here, although not as gr greatly blurred as we saw with high myopia, actually is more difficult to correct because it's below that green line and, and the eyeglasses will not correct for that. Now, I mentioned LASIK, which is an eye surgery that changes the shape of the cornea by ablating or removing some of the tissue. And these are examples where we took patients who were undergoing the surgery, we measured them before the surgery, simulated the vision, and measured them after the surgery. I think this is interesting because today, how does one evaluate the surgery? We go back to the eye chart, and the eye chart really has uh, uh, some limitations, some of which I already outlined earlier on. So the top image shows this patient before LASIK. It's, as you can tell now, a lot of myopia. And the bottom image shows after LASIK. There's a great improvement in terms of the vision that's there, but if you look closely, you'll see that that bottom image is still not very sharp. Let's look at another case, pre and post. This patient uh, arrived with a little less myopia at first and has a better result. But I'd like to compare the perfect image to the post-LASIK image. And if you look closely, you may notice that the post-LASIK image, although much better than the pre-LASIK image, is still not as good as the perfect image. And the reason why I want to point this out to you is because when you have this surgery, one of the problems is that the, the surgery itself may improve these low-order aberrations but actually induce some higher order aberrations. Not always, and there's a lot of research to improve this, but if that occurs, then the result is no longer uh, possible to be corrected with eyeglasses, as well as you would have been prior to the surgery. So that's one of my uh, things that I want people to understand. And uh, with that, I would say uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention.